Good morning, Robert. Okay, I'm going to frame this uh, one way, and you can answer any way you want. More than 1,000 guys getting ready to get out of jail. All of them deserve a second chance. None of them threats to society, right? Well, if you believe that, I got some property or a bridge I want to sell you <laughs> Arizona. So um, you're, not, uh, you're not too high on this plan? What do you think? What do you know? Well, as usual, um, the legislature didn't create a safety net for this kind of action. And a lot of these guys are being released administratively, which means there ha- there's been no hearing at all to find out, do they have a place to live? Do they have a job? Do they have any prospect of getting a job? Do they have any delays in which they're required to get a job? But none of that is in place for these people, as far as I understand. Scal- um, Scholar, you've seen the list, I guess. Um, about 200 or so are from the Caddo Bozier Webster. Um, Correct. Some of these folks, you anticipate, are going to get out and repeat crimes because we don't have all these programs in place that we were promised that are going to help these folks. We don't have those in place yet, do we? No, no, absolutely not. And that's what I, I spoke yesterday to a chamber group, and that's one of the things I talked about. This whole thing was called the Reinvestment Task Force, and it was put in place to find nonviolent offenders. And before that task force ever met the first time, they adopted a plan that was a template, if you will, from a, a very liberal think tank group that included not only violent offenders but sex offenders to release them early. Mm. And so they got off track almost from the beginning, and they, they talk about this being a you know bipartisan, widespread, panel of experts that served on the task force well of all the 50 odd people that were on this task force there was one da just one <laughs> what and was so, not uh, you huh mr scott what was the wasn't cri- me. what was the criterion for the release well, there, there were some parole officers there were some retired judges there were some retired legislators and things like that but um and there are a lot of social workers as you would expect but um the whole you know, to, to get let somebody out of prison on parole, which is not, you know, required under the Constitution or any law or anything, um, what are you going to do with them? If you don't have a safety net in place to say, okay, well, can this person work? Can this person go be a productive member of society? I don't have a problem with that concept if, if that's the case. But if you're just going to let them out, then we believe, we believe you've been here long enough. <clears throat> We've not done any, you know, sophisticated testing on you or anything like that um and and as a da i want to know does this guy have did he behave himself in prison can he play by the rules did or was he in 17 prison fights you know that's the kind of thing that we're interested in to where i can say okay well this guy probably does deserve a second chance mr scholar do you think this was a program that sort of from its inception well, let me think how I want to phrase this. Put the uh, put the cart before the horse in the sense that they sat down and said, we are going to release a lot of people from prison and we will make the law and eventually mold the rules to fit our end game. That, that morphed is the word that the DAs use. It just got morphed into including violent prisoners, sex offenders, and things like that. And at the end of the end of the legislative session, when the DA stood up and said, enough's enough, we, we we're willing to give. If you think right now the penalty for burglary is zero to 12 years, which means a judge, depending on your first, second, third offender, whatever, is zero to 12 years. Well, if if you as a legislator think, well, 12 years is a little too stiff a sentence for a burglar, I, I think 10 is more appropriate. I don't have a problem with that. If that's what the legislature thinks, then just go lower the law, lower the threshold of the, of the statute. But just go ahead and say that. Don't say... We're going to try to do this. We're going to reinvest all the savings that we save. They've made not one bill in this, started out as a 26-bill package, not one bill mandates a reinvestment. I, that, that, let me ask you a question because I talked to somebody high up in, a, in an area DA's office who told me this is not a reinvestment program like it's called, Justice Reinvestment. This Correct. is John Bell Edwards's way to cut the corrections budget, and that's all that's going to happen and that's what we're going to see because we incarcerate the highest. You'll hear them say it. We incarcerate right. the highest number of people per capita than any other state. Uh, where's the money for you guys to have programs for these folks? Who's? Why are we not out there screaming for that? 
Well, I, I agree with you. I would like to see right now our PNP our pro probation officers have about 113 to 120 person caseload. What they're supposed to have, according to the best practices nationally, is around 50, 52, 55, somewhere around there. Wow! So they've they already got more than double. Now we're going to release a just a you know truckload of these people from prison with. Absolutely no way to supervise them. No possible way do we have enough probation officers. So if you're going to do what they're doing, go hire uh, 20% more parole officers and put them out there to go check on these people every day and see what they're up to. Skylar, um, we're talking to Skylar Marvin, the DA in uh, Bozier, Webster Parishes. I did just did a quick check of 10 that are coming out in Caddo, Bozier. And in my just quick check of 10, I found one who has a long history of criminal behavior, including... Armed robbery, aggravated battery, resisting arrest. That sounds like a violent criminal to me. I thought we were releasing only nonviolent. How did this morph so? Well, it did that before they ever had the first task force meeting. They they just adopted what the, the Pew Foundation is a liberal think tank group that when all this got wheels under it, the Pew Foundation came and said, here, we're, we're here to help y'all. Here's a, a best practices model that we think will be perfect. Well, that model had been tried, has been tried in other states, actually called the exact same thing, justice reinvestment. Sounds good. If you walk into a Chamber of Commerce meeting and say, who in here is for reform, raise your hand. Every hand goes up. Mm-hmm. But when you ask what exactly is reform, what are you calling reform, that's what you need to know before you raise your hand. Mr. Scholar, the, the Louisiana reform that was implemented was similar to that which was implemented a few years ago in California. And from everything I've read, the recidivism rate in California for those released is in excess of 80%. Do you anticipate uh, something that, uh, a recidivism rate that high in this state? I would not be surprised. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, actually, but I'm not surprised by it at all. But that's going to happen if you don't do any type of background check on the person that you're trying to release, any type of testing, any type of uh, – does he have a family structure to fall on? You know, mm-hmm. somebody give him a place to live and help him find a job. Have you taught him anything in prison? Does he know how to go to a job interview and not wear a T-shirt that has holes in it? Does he – you know, things like that. They haven't taught them anything, but yet let's just cut them back loose. And, and again, I'm all about second second chances. I don't have a problem with that at all, but but give the guy something to, to work with. If you're just going to turn him back loose on the streets, you haven't done anything to help him. 